father would have her preach from time to time, but she had to really be pushed to get to the place where we had a 50-50 even Stephen marriage because her father was a marvelous man, but he handled all the money he did. It was one of those stereotypical things, and she, her mother had been quite content with it, and she planned to be also, but I insisted no. Mm -hmm. And so in handling money and handling decisions of all kinds, we all went and did it together. And so anywhere I went, if people wouldn't let her sit in the pulpit, I wouldn't sit there either. Amen. Oh, yeah. 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 We like you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> so, uh, and I know y'all talk together. Oh, it's quite a bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, she told me the story. You, you know, my, my, my claim to fame around you and Mother Mitchell is I got to, to, uh, Edit the last book she did. I edited that, that yeah. book with her. So it was a great experience to work with her and you on that. I mean, you were probably as active on the book as either one of us were. But her talking about the kind of support that you gave, not just to her, but to other women preachers, and being at ITC where sometimes uh, early, in the early, early years, male students who had to take her for preaching would turn their back in the classroom so they wouldn't have to receive from her. Do you remember those stories? I didn't even know what happened. You she told now, me that you're story. You're just now telling me about it. Yeah, she told me that story when we were at the Cathedral of Preachers in, in the, at the National Cathedral in the D.C. Yeah, well, uh, I did not know that people, students turned their back. Mm -hmm. I did. I can't. If I had known, I would have flunked more people. <laughs> yeah, you did. <laughs> no, I never flunked anybody. <laughs> but I was not aware of this, and I don't remember. I don't think she ever told me. She told. She told that story to me. I. I, I can I'm trying to think of who I was sitting in that conversation. Dr. Katie Cannon was there. Katie was there. We were having a conversation about what it had to. What. What kind of bravery women ministers have had to have. Mm. And she was talking about how supportive you were all along in your relationship. So. Uh, I'll put it this way too many women suffer from superiority. And I say that with complete candor. Do you mean male superiority? What do you mean no. by that? I mean I that, that the typical preacher that's so dead against <laughs> women is probably not as well educated or as gifted. I see what you mean. And they don't want women in the picture because they will be embarrassed, mm -hmm. to say the least. So I had a, a strong... Uh, I cover your back. I enjoyed her victory. We had a strange arrangement where, uh, well, let me tell you a story. I always got a story. <laughs> uh, there was a church down in the bushes from Richmond, uh, the first church that Wyatt Walker ever pastored. Can't remember the name of the town even now, village or whatever. So they had a family day or something, and they wanted both of us to speak. So my wife spoke at 11, and I spoke in the afternoon. So I preached somewhere in Richmond in the morning, and drove down there, so I'll eat dinner, and then I'll preach. When I got there, dinner was over, and they were already well on their way. It was only 2 o'clock. So I had to, to walk in the door and stand up preaching right now. After the service was over, a man that I thought of as old in those days, because he was probably about 85, but I'm 10 years older than that now, so, so it's not old anymore. <laughs> Tall, straight gentleman, he came and said, Sir, your wife preached here this morning. And I said, Remember, you are a great preacher. 
To which she said, well, what do you hear my husband? <laughs> then he stopped. It was obvious he was having a terrible time trying to phrase what was on his mind. <laughs> but he just put it out. You may be louder, but you sure ain't no better. That's <laughs> <laughs> funny. Yeah, it's funny, Bob. <laughs> so when I, when I would go to churches after that, and know that people were sitting there on their edge to see which one of them was going to be the best. When I tell that, that story, because it was a very true story, uh, it put them at ease because she couldn't wait to hear how I got along when we, we both went some place different. And I, could, I, would, I would call her up. I wouldn't wait till she got there. How was it? How was it? I got much more joy out of her victories than I did out of mine. Now that's a kind of sickness some people say, but in any case, I was more inclined to rejoice when she really blew it. And sometimes she did. I mean, she had to made it. Her voice, everything was just fabulous. And uh, so uh, I miss her, and uh, nobody now to uh, rejoice when you preach. <laughs> Well, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Among other things. You were the Martin Luther King Jr. Chair in 1966, Colgate. King was still living, then he dies two years later. Where were you when he died? What was that time like for you 